Father, we thank you for another day, another opportunity, another chance. God, we thank you for blessing us again, Father God, to come this far. We thank you, Lord, for we have not been able to keep ourselves. But God, you kept us. You blessed us. You have proven over and over again that you are our strength. You are our hope. You are our deliverance. And for that, Lord, we say thank you. We thank you, Father God, for who you are and for what you do. We say hallowed to your name, Father God, for blessing us. Now, Lord, we ask you to forgive us for our sins, bless our lives, keep us focused on you, and bless us to walk in you, Father God. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless your word tonight, that your word will fall on good soil, that your word, Father God, will make us the better, that your word, Father God, will speak to us, and that we, Father God, will obey it. And Lord, we ask you to keep the glory. All done and all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Hallelujah. God is certainly our strength. And there's no strength like him and there is no strength other than in him that we ought to depend on. Mm -hmm. We're looking at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. We begin tonight at verse number 6. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse number 6. Please remember that we appreciate your presence here tonight. We appreciate you being a part of our celebration of Jesus Christ through Bible study on tonight. We've come to celebrate the conquering King of Calvary, Jesus Christ himself. We are celebrating him tonight, and we're doing so by studying the word of God and celebrating Jesus Christ. Second Thessalonians chapter three, verses six through nine is where we are tonight. And you will see as we come to a close why I stopped at nine, because I don't want to dive into a major subject matter that begins in verse number 10. Second <laughs> Thessalonians chapter three, verses six to through nine is where we are tonight. The Apostle Paul is closing out the book of Thessalonians. He's writing to the Thessalonians. He's saying to those in the city of Thessalonica, he's saying to them, I want to make sure that you pray for us. He says, pray for us that the word of God will spread swiftly, that the word of God will be glorified, that Jesus Christ will bless the going forth of the word. He says, pray for us. Every blood-bought believer ought to be praying for the spreading of the word of God. You see, the first century church, when they walked in Christ, when they had tension, when they had opposition, the word of God spread it tremendously. The question for us tonight, is the word of God spreading in our tough times? Are we able to take the word of God to the hedges and the highways the Apostle Paul says, first of all, we ought to be praying for those who are going, and then we ought to be praying that God sends us, that the word of God will spread. He says, pray for us, brothers and sisters, pray for us, 
that the word of God will run with the swiftness, that the word of God will be swift in its running, and that the word of God will be glorified. He says that we will be delivered from evil men, from wicked men, from unreasonable men. So he says, first of all, pray for us that we will be in such a mannerism, such an attitude, and such a blessed posture that the word of God will run swiftly. Then he says, pray for us that we will be delivered from evil and wicked men because there are some who do not believe. There are some who have no faith. He says, pray for us. He says, but you need to remember, in verse number three, he says, you need to remember one thing, and that is, the Lord is faithful. He said, the Lord God, he is faithful. The Lord, the supreme authority, he is faithful. He is trustworthy. The Lord is trustworthy. Who will establish you, who will stabilize you and confirm you. He will strengthen you and guard you from the evil one. He will guard you. He will, he will protect you. He will preserve you. He will keep you from the evil one. And that we have confidence in the Lord concerning you. He says, we, we got the confidence. He says, the Apostle Paul is talking to this church where he he is a, a itinerary pastor, a itinerary preacher. He's saying to them, y'all pray for us. Pray that the word goes forth. Pray that we did get delivered from evil men. And then he says that you will be established and that God will guard you from the devil, from the evil one, from the accuser of, of the brethren. He says that... that we have confidence in the Lord concerning you. He says, we, we really, really are assured. We are assured. We have assurance. So where it comes to this means we have the assurance that in the Lord, you will be one who will be able to be established, who will be able to, to stand. We got confidence in you. We got confidence in you in the Lord. That's why when we when we have confidence in, in someone, it ought to be as it is unto the Lord. In other words, in our own strength, we cannot do what God has called us to do. Yes. So Sir David says that that God has strength. He has strength like none other. Yes. He has strength like no other. He has strength that nothing and no one else has to offer us. We ought, to, we ought to depend on his strength. So the apostle Paul says here, I got confidence in you all. I got confidence in the Lord concerning you. He says, I place my confidence in the Lord. And I believe that you can stand as the Lord stands with you and as the Lord stands for you both that you will continue to do what's right and both that you are doing right right now. He says, whatever you do, I want to make sure you understand this salutation. May the Lord direct your hearts. May the Lord guide your heart. May the Lord guide your innermost being, your mind, your, your spirit. May the Lord guide you. We cannot keep ourselves. We cannot keep our focus on the Lord. It takes the Lord to guide us. Yes, Lord. It takes the Lord to keep us. It takes the Lord to give us the love of God and the patience of Jesus Christ, the anointed one. And that brings us to verse number six. Tonight, Paul is offering a warning against idleness, against idle men. He's offering a warning. I always tell our people, our, our youth and our young people, don't be idle. Back home in the backwoods of Mississippi, the, the senior saints would say it like this, a idle mind is the devil's workshop. Mm -hmm. 
an idle mind is the devil's workshop. In other words, the devil is always busy when there's idleness. Mm -hmm. That's why I don't want to sit idle. People who sit at home all day and do nothing, the devil fills their mind, fills their hearts with devilment because they're idle. Let me just say to you, you ought to have something to do. If you're retired, you ought to have something to do. If you are handicapped, you ought to have something to do. If you're challenged in your, your mental state, if you're challenged in your physical state, there is something that the Lord has for you to do because you're still here. Yes, when your days are over down here, your work will be done down here. Right. So the Apostle Paul exhorts them tonight. He exhorts them to make sure that you guard against idleness. And he says, warn other people to guard against idleness. And then as we break this particular pericope down, you will find out that he says there are disciplinary procedures that ought to take place. If you find one that's not in the will of the Lord, and if you find one that's not obeying the traditions and the customs that we've taught you, and when you find one that's just sitting idle, there are some disciplines of the church that ought to take place. You see, we believe in, in government agencies disciplining us. We believe in the court systems disciplining us, but we don't believe in church discipline. The Apostle Paul says tonight that we ought to be disciplined even in church. Let's look at what it says. Verse number six, 2 Thessalonians chapter three, beginning at verse number six. But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the traditions which he received from us. Strong language here. And he supports it with the authority. Let me show you here. He says, we command you. He says, this is not an option. He says, this is not a suggestion. This is very strong language that the Apostle Paul uses. He says, we command you. We don't give you an option. You are saved. Boy, if the preacher would talk like this on Sunday, the church would empty itself. Well, people would empty the church because no one in today's church want to be commanded by the man of God of nothing. But the apostle Paul, the pastor, the apostle Paul, the, the, the father in the ministry, the apostle Paul writes the letter to the church at Thessalonica and he says to the Thessalonians, he says to the church at Thessalonica, he says to them, we command you. Mm -hmm. Peter, he says, he says, we command you. The apostle Paul says here that Timothy, Silas, and Paul, we command you. We command you, brother. And then he supports it with the ultimate authority. You see that authority there? The ultimate authority is the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, not only do we give you no option. He, he says, this is not a suggestion. It's a command. I'm telling you, I'm not asking you. I'm commanding you. Not only am I commanding you, I am backing it up. In the name above every name. I'm bagging it up in the title, above every title, the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, the anointed one himself. He says, this is a serious matter. He says, first of all, I'm telling you to do it. I'm commanding you. And then he says, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the greatest authority of all time, there will never be another authority greater than this authority. He says, I command you, brethren. Now he's talking to believers. He's talking to those who are born again. He's talking to those 
who have given their lives to Jesus Christ. He says, I command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of Jesus the Christ, our Lord, the anointed one. The word Christ means the anointed one. Mm -hmm. That you withdraw from every brother who walks unorderly, who walks out of character. He says, whatever you do, understand I'm commanding you by the Lord Jesus Christ, by our Lord Jesus Christ, since you are saved and I'm saved, he is our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm commanding you to withdraw from every brother who walks, every brother who lives. Word walks means to live. Word walks means to carry yourself in such a way. Every brother who carried themselves in a disorderly way and not according to the traditions which he received from us. The thing that was going on during this time, there were men who, who were erring in their doctrine. And because their doctrine was not solid, the Apostle Paul many times had to remind the church at Thessalonica, whatever you do, don't latch on to that stuff. The Apostle Paul says, whatever you do, make sure you stay focused on the word of God that we have presented to you. This word tradition means the principles. This word tradition means the ordinances. The word tradition, this word tradition is not the word tradition as we see it from day to day. This word tradition means the ordinance of God that we have presented to you Make sure you withdraw from any brother who does not keep these ordinances. You know, there are some people that you can hang around and some you can't. There are some people that you can get in a conversation with that you just have to tell them, you know, I don't have these type of conversation until I'm around you. I don't hear these type of words until I'm around you. I don't hang out with people. You have to tell them, I don't hang out with people who do what you do and you do it in such a way that you have an arrogance about you. There are so many narcissistic people in this world that we are coming face to face with every day. Meaning that these people, they, they are bold in their disorderly conduct. You know, we get arrested for disorderly conduct, for acting a fool. But he's saying in the church, in their lifestyles, in their day-to-day -day walking, if they're disorderly, the church ought to be the body who refrains from hanging out with them. He said, withdraw from them. And you tell them, I just can't hang out with you because of what you do. I can't hang out with you because you don't believe what I believe. I can't hang out with you because I am sure, I'm assured by this gospel of Jesus Christ and I'm going to live according to the book. And as I live according to the book and you choose not to, I can't hang out with you. The Bible says, the apostle Paul says, withdraw from them. It says, leave them alone, pull away. It says to refrain from, from hanging out with them. He says to leave them alone as if they have a plague. He says those who live and walk disorderly and don't walk according to the doctrine that we've given you, don't walk according to the tradition, that do not walk according to the, the, the word of God that you've been taught, that we have given you. He says walk away from them. The problem with most people is that they have a problem with walking away. Right. They have a problem with, with not hanging out with certain people. The Apostle Paul says, we expect you to withdraw, meaning to withhold fellowship with them. You are expected, if they are a disobedient person, you are expected to not allow that person to participate in the love feast. In other words, they had love feasts. 
if a person is not walking in love, if a person is not living by love, then they ought not to be hanging out and giving into love feasts. In other words, it says withdraw from them. Another thing that, that they withdrew from them was communion or the Lord's Supper. He says, withdraw from them the Lord's Supper. That's why before we take communion, we always say, do not drink unworthy, unworthy, worthy. In other words, don't drink damnation unto your soul because you're walking in a manner that does not please God. You ought to examine yourself. And it doesn't take anybody else to examine you. You ought to examine yourself. Let me just stop right here and say, those who serve communion, those who fix communion, those who prepare communion, as well as those who partake in communion, those who drink and eat communion, hearts ought to be right before they serve, before they put it together, before they, they, they participate in it, before they eat it, your hearts ought to be right. Because if your heart's not 